from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I think anybody who's ever been moved by music, anybody who's ever had an emotional reaction, whether it was goosebumps or tears or laughter or just a sense of joy, a sense of unity, of oneness with the world from a piece of music, anybody who's ever had this kind of emotional reaction, I, I think you wouldn't be here if you hadn't had that feeling at least once in your life, anybody who's had that has probably wondered why. Why is this happening? Where does this come from? I think to begin with, um, we can look at the early origins of music. And it's important to realize that the way music is today isn't necessarily the way music was across evolutionary timescales. It doesn't do much good to look at music of the last 15 years or the last 500 years. We have to think about music as it was for thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of years going back to the beginning of our species. Now, the available evidence that Pinker might be wrong comes from a number of sources. Uh, when Pinker says that language preceded music, there actually isn't so much evidence for that. The weight of evidence is on the other side. To begin with, Stephen Mython in his excellent book, The Singing Neanderthals, and many others have argued that uh, music characterized the communicative faculty of the Neanderthals. Neanderthals, of course, preceded us, Homo sapiens, and the way in which they communicated was largely through musical uh, gestures. Uh, alterations alternations in pitch and time. Alternations in pitch and time, that's about as good a definition of music as I can think of. The way the Neanderthals communicated was a language that didn't have words or specific tokens, but had these kinds of prosodic trajectories that uh, would communicate emotional things. Uh, I think the closest thing I can imagine to Neanderthal communication is the way the teachers and the adults in the Charlie Brown and Peanuts cartoons used to talk, right? So the kids would talk in regular language, but whenever a teacher would talk, it would sort of be wah, 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 or wah, 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 right? You had all of this musical quality, and you really knew what was going on. You knew whether they were asking a question or whether they were angry or whether they were upset or happy or content, all with the sort of pitch trajectory. And that's what Neanderthal communication seemed to be like. If you look at our nearest um, biological cousins, the chimpanzees, the pan hoot of the chimpanzee, the primary way in which chimpanzees communicate with one another, is again variations in pitch and rhythm. The pan hoot doesn't have particular elements that be, can, can be recombined the way we do with language. It really is more musical than it is language-like. Some of the hallmarks of human language are this, this idea that you can recombine elements, you can create an infinity of different utterances, different elements of, of the sentence stand for certain things in the real world. Language is referential. It refers to, th to specific things. Chimpanzee communication is not like that. It's more musical. It's more holistic. So what you'd have to believe if you want to say that language in humans preceded music is that Homo sapiens somehow forgot about the music that Neanderthals and chimpanzee had, ch chimpanzees had. They discovered language, spoken language, and then at some point later, rediscovered music. That, that just doesn't seem very parsimonious. Another piece of evidence comes from neural, uh, neural studies, brain imaging studies. We put people in a brain scanner and look at what parts of the brain are activated when they listen to music or language, and it's the more primitive parts of the brain, the cerebellum, the brain stem, the pons, that are selectively activated to music and not to language. This suggests because these areas are older, in our brain, the areas we have in common with all mammals, indeed with all vertebrates, it suggests that because music is activating them, music is phylogenetically older. Also consider the way that music actually was practiced for tens of thousands of years. Music, in almost every case, was music dance. There was no separation between the two. When people were making music, they were dancing. Now, we sort of forget that, many of us today in contemporary society, where we sit in rooms just like this, where Bartok performed, where uh, Stravinsky and others performed, and we're supposed to sit here with our hands folded quietly in our laps, and we're not supposed to move, and we're not supposed to make a sound. But this is evolutionarily very foreign to our species. For tens of thousands of years, music and movement always went together, so much so that in most of the world's languages today, the word for music and the word for dance are the same word. 
The languages themselves don't make a distinction because there was never a time when any speaker of that language had to refer to one without referring to the other. So it's music dance in most of the world's cultures. It's not in ours. We separate the two. We even have, in modern dance, you can have dance without music. And obviously, we have music without dance. But that's a, a, a relatively new evolutionary uh, finding uh, or happenstance. So historically and linguistically, they were intertwined. And consider also the connection between music and movement is so intimate that you can't make music without movement. Any musical sound, and I'm talking on an acoustic or a physical level, any musical sound requires some movement to get it started. You have to bang on something or pluck something or strum or blow through something or at least force air through your own vocal column or bang on your chest Bobby McFerrin style in order to get the molecules in the atmosphere moving and that's what sound is. So music begins with movement and the idea that music and movement were intertwined really gives us a window into how they may have functioned in uh, evolutionary timescales. For one thing, humans are the only mammalian species that can synchronize to movement, uh, synchronize our movement to sound, synchronize movement to music. Now, there's a cockatoo that Ani Patel has been studying that you can see the video on YouTube. It seems as though the cockatoo can synchronize its movement to music about 20% of the time and for about 15 seconds at a time. Ani, my, my colleague, is still trying to work out the statistics on this as to whether that constitutes uh, something different from chance or not. If, he turns, if it turns out that the cockatoo can't do it, we're the only species, not just the only mammal. But let's just say for now we're the only mammalian species that can do it. It's actually quite extraordinary. Infants can do this. Think about what's going on in the brain. The sound comes in the ear, and somehow the motor system is able to figure out how to move the body in order to synchronize with this thing that's coming in through an entirely different sense. It comes in through the sense of hearing, it comes out through the motor system, and it comes out pretty well synchronized. Elephants and chimpanzees will bang on sticks and they can even keep a steady tempo, but they can't synchronize to one another. Well, the kinds of large-scale human cooperative undertakings, buildings of cities, aqueducts, irrigation systems, buildings, um, you know, the, uh, even just um, agriculture, clearing uh, an area for a village. If you're a nomadic people and you're trying to set up a, an altar to worship at and you have to move it, all this kind of heavy lifting requires synchronization. And that synchronization was almost always done to music. If you're doing the one, two, heave, ho, you all have to ho at the same time or that big boulder isn't going to move. The work parties that we have uh, heard of, you know, chain gangs and things in our lifetime were all moving to music. The ancient rowers trying to row across the seas were rowing to music. This is the connection between music and movement, and it shows up even in neuroanatomy. When we put people in the brain scanner and we ask them to lie perfectly still and listen to music, the part of their brain that would be moving their bodies, the motor cortex, is active even if they're lying perfectly still. It takes a great act of will to hold the body still when there's music playing. And we see the neural evidence of this, the motor cortex, the premotor cortex, the supplementary motor areas, the parts that would be doing this motor action planning are wildly active when music is going. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.